that was absolutely wonderful. I'm not usually one for seafood, but that was delicious, wasn't it? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm also not one for small talk, as you've probably noticed, but of course, uh, neither are the two of you. Uh, uh, um, so, Afeni, Marina's told you what she's helping me with at the moment, has she? Yes. Uh, Marina, one day you're going to have to teach me what this whole hand-waving thing means. Uh, uh, does that mean he's, he's happy about it? Oh, well, good, I'm glad about that. Uh, well... Oh, I know what let's do. How about we let Afeni press the button on the randomizer this week? Okay, here we go. Well, Afeni, you, uh, you certainly have a lot of books here, don't you? Hmm. Oh, thank God. Right, let's see. Well, once again, the randomizer is treating us to a series that we've not yet seen come up. Here's Space Precinct Deadline. So I I first saw Space Precinct when it was shown on BBC. Uh, I want to say autumn 1995 was when that was on. I was so excited for this show uh, because I knew, I, I loved obviously the earlier Jerry Anderson shows that had been played on the BBC, Thunderbird, Stingray, Scarlet and Joe 90. Um, and I'm not sure to what extent I was aware, but I knew that they weren't like current shows, these were old shows. But here came a brand new Jerry Anderson series for my generation. And uh, even though looking at it today, it is very uneven. Um, there's a lot that works, there's a lot that doesn't. As a kid, I just adored this show. I would watch this every week. Uh, Monday nights, I think it was on BBC Two. Um, I don't have particularly strong memories of this episode though. So it'll be interesting to see what we come up with here. Imagine relaxing, climate controlled. Uh, now this episode uh, features this uh, dirigible covered in uh, advertising screens, and is very off, um, very obviously a nod to similar kind of things in Blade Runner, uh, which I've actually only seen a couple of times. So I'm not hugely qualified to talk about Blade Runner, but um, it is obviously a huge influence on the design aesthetic of this show. Demeter City is very much based on. Uh, the, the styles of, of uh, cities you would see in Blade Runner. And you can see that influence actually going back to Space Police, the original pilot. There's a, a shot in that of Brogan's cruiser just flying across the city that is so obviously a, a nod to a specific shot from Blade Runner. This reminds me of that belly dancer on Owl Lab 7. You relate everything to the opposite sex, Haldane? Yeah. Doesn't everybody? And this is something that I, I don't think gets enough uh, praise in Space Precinct. The Jack Haldane character, on paper, should be absolutely, god-awfully unbearable. Rob Youngblood does a fantastic job with Haldane. I, to the extent that this character that I, I really should hate, um, is probably one of my, my favourite characters on the show. Um, because you can see he does have that, that sort of brash, know-all exterior. Um, but he, he gives it this underlying sense of, of vulnerability. You know that a lot of it, the cockiness, is just an act. And it's it's lovely when you see the real character shining through underneath. We'll take it, Jane. We copy, Brogan. We'll stay on the limo. This is a lovely opening uh, effect sequence. I do love it whenever multiple police cruisers are tearing through the city. It does look really nice, especially at night. I don't think Demeter City really looks all that good there. Uh, in uh, daytime shots, which thankfully were only limited to really the first few episodes, then I think they must have realised the city just looked so much better at night, and they they stuck with night shots for the rest of the series. Um, and here's a, a fun nod to the old sort of World War Two uh, scenario of kind of um, bouncing the bomb to uh, to knock it off course, which was uh, uh, realised uh, quite spectacularly in uh, Thunderbirds as well in Ricochet. Oh, that is a fantastic shot of the cruiser crash landing into the, the cafe. Culminating in... A very cheesy one line. Table for two. Can you remember the last time we had a moment to ourselves? I mean, you know, like this. A sleeper awake. <laughs> now here we have uh, something that had to happen, I think by law, in every single Space Precinct episode. We had to have scenes of Lieutenant Brogan at home, and 
this is something that I hugely sympathise with Jerry Anderson over because I am absolutely convinced that these scenes were there as a direct response to people who reviewed his previous live action shows and saying, oh, he's he's got rid of the puppets, but the actors are still wooden and, and humorous things like that that we've all heard. And stopping the story cold every week to have these uh, just designated character moments. With um, I mean, Brogan's family aren't entirely likable. I've got to say they're not. Uh, if I had a family like Brogan's, I would probably want to be out on the street risking being shot by uh, by murderous criminals as well. But uh, it is such a shame because you can see that Jerry has put all this stuff in as a response to those criticisms, and by and large, it utterly fails to the point where these scenes were being criticised by people reviewing the show. Just as badly as the previous reviews were giving him. Um, Should have stuck with New Hawaii. At least you know where to find it. I, I just, I feel so sorry for him. Now here we have a uh, another look at the uh, the streets of Demeter City, and uh, I think one of the the failings of this show is that Demeter City, although the models look spectacular, especially at night, as I previously said, the um, street scenes, the live action street scenes, look absolutely terrible. I mean, this shot of the the uh, Fat Creon's car just driving right down the street is uh, quite embarrassing. Ow, don't touch me! <laughs> but it's not just that, it's the fact that Space, Space Precinct was produced in the early 1990s, and their vision of the future in terms of um, clothing and hairstyles and even discos in several episodes seemed to be the 1980s are back and they're back in a big way. Uh, it just... It, all the you know neon dyed hair and uh, various other flash clothes. I mean, there's an old man there with bright pink dreadlocks. What is that about? There he is again. Oh, now we have a pair of uh, sinister creons who we later find out are in league with our main guest star for this episode. For each body part is pretty mind boggling. The wonderful. Uh, and I use the, the word in uh, all possible connotations, Stephen Burkoff, who uh, had previously appeared in uh, UFO several episodes as uh, an interceptor pilot. Yes, Doctor. Uh, Stephen Burkoff is one of those actors who, uh, I think much like uh, Brian Blessed, um, for the first few decades of their acting career, they were just an ordinary actor with, you know, delivering good performances, but nothing really... Stand out, and then they become almost a parody of themselves. And I think by this point, Stephen Burkhoff was very much, uh, very much a parody of himself. Away from asteroid A16, a miner who died in a cave-in. Any scenery there that there is around to chew, he will just latch onto it with uh, both gums and not let go. Now, uh, the design of Wirt here, this uh, alien tramp, the uh, Clyburn. It's a very nice design, and uh, I could be wrong, but I don't remember seeing any other Clyburns in any other episodes. Um, obviously, the Creons and the Tarns are the main uh, residents of Demeter City. Occasionally, you had uh, the uh, Zyronites appearing in uh, a couple of stories. But by and large, the background aliens were, I think they were called Jellyheads. They were just uh, very limited, uh, simple masks, no real elaborate animatronics. So it's a shame, if I'm right, that the Clybans never returned, that uh, that they weren't thought worthy of being brought back, because it's a very nice design. The three-arm thing, I think, works really well. And the faces are very expressive as well, even on the old lady that we saw earlier who was knitting. Oh, and there we go. The emergency services number in Demeter City is 911, which again points to my earlier comment that uh, Tony, I'll transplants to the latest. The space precinct's idea of the future was just it's going to be more or less like it is now. Um, Paradise Street, Code Three. I, I, we never really got a sense of any any true alien cultures in this show. It was just like Demeter City was basically New York with flying cars, which is you know is nice enough, but uh, it's not quite all it could have been. All I know is it was a couple of creons. Now this kid playing um, uh, Wirt's friend Speedy, I think it was. Uh, I seem to recall seeing him in in several adverts um, 
made around this time. Uh, I think toy commercials. I could be wrong. I'll have to look that up. Um, and considering the level of dubbing that was going on elsewhere in the series, uh, rather unnecessary dubbing, I think, it's interesting that this this uh, kid actor, whose name I don't know, um, actually delivers a really good performance, and his voice is not dubbed. Uh, I'm wondering if he might... Just more than I can say for most humans. ...might actually be American. I don't think a, a British kid could probably pull off such a good American accent at that point. So you'll find him? But it is a really nice performance of this... Uh, this street urchin who just wants to get his friend back. I can't afford any damage to my reputation. Believe oh, this is some prime Stephen Burkhoff we're getting here. He is uh, even in parts like this, which would be very, very minor in his career, to the extent where I doubt he even remembers doing this. He is always you always know what you're going to get with him, and you also know that it's going to be a bit weird and a bit. Um, slightly off kilter with the rest of the performances that are going on around him. That's probably why he's had such a such a long career, because uh, it's dependable weird that Stephen Burkhoff brings to uh, to his roles. Okay, so far we've got a death. See that that there's a shot there of Demeter City in broad daylight. And it looks fairly unimpressive. Just reinforces what I said earlier, the nighttime model shots in this show are really lovely, and I'm not entirely sure what what the problem is. Um, other than that, the night adds obviously a lot of shadow. There's like there's more atmosphere in the nighttime shots with like smoke and such drifting around. In broad daylight, it is just a blue sky, and the models really do look more like models. Whereas in the nighttime shots, they're bordering on sort of feature film quality. It's a real for lack of a better term, night and day difference. Stephen Burkhoff's idea of being a doctor just seems to be sit on a little round table, drumming his fingers on the desk and looking grumpy. Um, I would love to know what he's like in real life, actually. I can't imagine he's too far removed from this. Dr. Jory, Amanda Spock, Demeter City Times. Now, here we have uh, uh, Jane Castle has gone... Uh, well, not undercover, but she's uh, posing as a reporter in order to get more information out of uh, Dr. Jury. Now, uh, I am aware that Simone Bendix was not happy with this uh, this uh, sexy outfit that she was forced to wear. Um, and I also remember a lot of shots from this episode of her in this costume were used in like pre -publi -publici pre publicity material. Um, I had a scrapbook as a kid I used to save cuttings of uh, space piece uh, space precinct related bits and pieces and I remember there was an article about the launch of the show that was like 80% a photo of her in this costume now um great many different species while I certainly think that uh, I certainly understand her um her issues with the character being presented this way and I don't think um of the human characters I don't think Jane Castle was um, was given the strongest introduction. I think Brogan and Haldane were, because they had each other to spark off of. Castle was more seen with uh, with the alien characters. And I get the feeling that Simone Bendix was kind of lost in the early episodes, that she wasn't sure how to interact with these, uh, these bizarre creatures. I think she very quickly picked it up. Um, but uh, died in an accident. She she was off to a fairly rocky start, and this episode was I think the eighth made, and not not a good sign to get something like this so early on down the road um, to be pushed as the sex symbol rather than an equal colleague to the male characters. Um, I will say one word about the uh, the outfit she's wearing here. Gosh, a reporter was here. Asking about a Clyburn called Udo Wirt. Now here we have uh, Dr. Jory uh, telling off his two Creon henchmen, Rick and Pike. Now Pike is... Uh, he's ringing some bells with me, actually, because I'm looking at him and thinking... Uh, I, I seem to recognise the posture, the body language, the, uh, the tone of the voice. It's going to drive me nuts if I can't figure it out. You go down. See that voice? I recognize that voice. Now that we have that settled, I'm going to have to look on the end credits and see who played Pike now because uh, 
That's gonna bother me otherwise. <coughs> oh no, here we have another street scene in Demeter City where they're watching a, uh, a robotic mime and... Yeah, as I said earlier, Demeter City is where the 80s went to die. It's uh, oh, fairly cheesy and it's made worse by the fact that I'm pretty sure throughout the entire series the only street level Demeter City scenes we have are all shot on this one set with a very clean floor. It's just one corner of an alleyway with like a, a warehouse door in one corner and a little video phone in another. Some more money really needed to be thrown at uh, at the Demeter City stuff. Oh my goodness, there is an extra there who I I can't even begin to to describe what he's wearing. He looks about sixty, possibly older. It looks like I tell you what it looks like. It looks like if uh, if a glam rocker was cosplaying as Isaac Newton in the future. That's what I'm seeing here. My folks walked off a colony ship right into the Tarn Crayon riots. They never had a chance. And now that, that's an, another interesting little bit of world building there. And it's such a shame, as I said earlier, that this series never really established truly alien cultures. I mean, what are the differences between the Creons and the Tarns? Aside from the fact that the Tarns have one more eye than the Creons, I don't know what we're supposed to what we're supposed to know about them, um, they are basically interchangeable, which is a shame because you're creating a whole alien species, a whole alien world. You can do so many things with this and they just kind of like... It was too much trouble. I suppose the the focus was on the storylines and the action, which to some extent I can understand, but uh, it is a huge missed opportunity that Altor is, uh, is just New York 2.0. What's with a peanut butter? We had a deal. She gets a good grade. <laughs> you cop for the peanut butter. I heard of that stuff. Never had it though. See, this is another uh, example of why the Brogan family storylines were, on the whole, the kind of lame. It's like peanut butter. Thanks. That's the plot line for this episode. Get Brogan's daughter a jar of peanut butter. Oh, drama. Will she get the peanut butter? And do we care? A perfect match. Tissue and blood. That voice is driving me crazy. I know that voice. How's the peanut butter hunt coming, Dad? Oh, this is not seriously the subplot, is it? You know, Dad, I've been giving this peanut butter thing a lot of thought. And oh, God, I'm shut up about peanut butter. Do something interesting. It can be smooth or crunchy. Hi. Mm -hmm. Why don't you, um, take off your clothes and join me? And I do remember watching this as a kid and just oh, thinking, oh no, these scenes are coming and and I can go off and get a drink or make a sandwich or something, come back three minutes later and I won't really have missed anything important because it's just chatter. Did you have any luck with that peanut butter? Oh, shut up! Shut up! You too. Oh, there is more to science fiction action and adventure than peanut butter. Oh, damn my need for peanut butter. My enemies know my greatest weakness, peanut butter! At the parking lot in the central hub. Oh man, a limo and two Koreans. Oh, Took's uh, third eye open there for uh, seemingly no reason. I don't ever remember seeing that before. The eye usually just opened if she needed to use it to to perform a telekinesis thing. So I wonder if that was the eye malfunctioning. Which is uh, rare, actually, for the animatronics in Space Precinct. I don't generally remember ever seeing any of them malfunction like that. Bottom line. I'm Stephen Burkoff, and I get to do whatever I want. Stay with him, Haldane. Now, this episode, I think, is the first episode to, uh, to include that little teddy bear on... Uh, Castle and Took's uh, cruiser bonnet. And it just got a nice close-up there, uh, illuminated by the lightning. And that was a lovely simple touch to differentiate between the two vehicles. It also uh, a is a nice... I'm doing my best. A, a nice nod for the two characters, that they would uh, would have a little teddy bear like that. And I think we just had a continuity error there, where um, the shot of uh, Rick and Pike... Don't delay. 
approaching the dirigible, they had Wurt's body in the back. Is Wurt's body... I thought Wurt was, um... Was dead and gone and plundered for organs by this point. This doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. It Name's Brogan. He's a cop. Huh. Now, oh right, so, so the two Creons, Rick and um, and Pike, went to collect Stephen Burkoff. They said they were, that's that's what they said they were going to do. Then we saw that shot of them approaching the dirigible with Wirt in the back. Was Wirt meant to be Stephen Burkoff? Did they just slip that in as a very quick, quick shot because they forgot to put Stephen Burkoff in the back of the, the limo and uh, they thought nobody would notice? I mean, Wirt's bright purple. It, there's no way you couldn't notice that the uh, the previously dead character was uh, suddenly in the back of the car again. I'm not operating on a man unless he's properly sedated. I don't want to risk damaging his heart. It makes me very anxious, and when I'm anxious, I get even more Burkoffy than usual, and you don't want me when I'm very Burkoffy. Oh, that's a fairly unimpressive end to, uh, to Stephen Burkoff in this episode. It's nice that he uh, he joined forces with Brogan at the end there, did the right thing, which is rare for the, uh, the villains in Space Precinct to change sides like that, but he just got shot down, and that's him dead on the sofa. Um... No, end of Stephen Burkoff. That's not very impressive. Not a very Burkoff way to go. We we expect better deaths from Stephen Burkoff than just a quick, you know, bang, smash, sofa, and he's gone. He needs a proper hammy death, damn it. He's Stephen Burkoff. Getting some lovely shots of the uh, the dirigible here, and I also like the interior scenes where. The camera is swaying. You get the impression that it is this big floating thing that uh, that people are having difficulty walking on. Uh, Pike is making his escape from the dirigible, and I'm still, I am still looking at this guy and thinking, I recognise him. Whoa. Okay, that is a very cool crash landing shot of the cruiser crashing into the dirigible, and uh, there was even a little model Brogan there waiting to jump on. That's quite sweet. Traffic. Go, 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 go. That seemed to be uh, Brogan's catchphrase after a... Uh, I love this job. It was, go, 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 move, 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 move! Which uh, I, I don't think was unique to him. It was more uh, sort of 80s, 90s uh, action uh, cliché line. This is what we want from Space Precinct. Lots of cruisers flying around, sirens blazing. And Pike is now being chased by Orin and Romek. And I'm still looking at him and thinking... I recognise it's something in the face as well, not just the voice and the body language, but... Oh well, he's dead now. And this explosion, the dirigible going up in flames, is a beautiful shot. Except for the fact that it... And look, the whole city is on fire! In a Thunderbirds episode, that would be like where the story starts. In Space Precinct, it's like, well, we've blown up half the city, our work here is done, we can go home. There's no consequences to this... Uh, hideously devastating explosion that has to have claimed uh, one or two lives and not just the baddies. Well now everything has been wrapped up, the uh, organ leggers have been stopped, but we still have one final plot point to clear up. Will Brogan get the peanut butter? I got my sources. And there we have it, we have peanut butter! We have peanut butter! Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. How about a peanut butter sandwich? Oh, there we go. See, peanut butter, it brings people together. Peanut butter is the the solution to all of life's problems. And there we are, that was Deadline. Um, not one of my favourite episodes of Space Precinct, but... Uh, Certainly an improvement on some of the other earlier episodes, and in particular the model effects were great. I'm looking at these end credits here, and I'm trying to see... No, there's no credit for um, for Pike, which is really odd. Um, I suppose we could ask uh, Richard James, since uh, Richard James is uh, the co -ho one of the co-hosts, or no, the co-host of this podcast, uh, with Mr. Jamie Anderson. And obviously Richard James would have been on set when all this was happening. Um... So perhaps Richard James could enlighten us as to uh, just who played Pike, if he could solve the mystery for me, because, uh, like I said, the voice is very familiar, the body language is very familiar, something about the face is very familiar. So, over to you, Mr. Richard James. Can you illuminate for our listeners just who exactly 
was Pike.